Let's uh, start this uh, exciting colloquium uh, section. It's a great pleasure to uh, introduce today for you uh, Professor Jan de Boer from the University of Amsterdam in the Netherlands. Uh, just a short uh, compressed CV of, uh, of Jan. Uh, so Jan, Jan got his PhD in 1993 at Utrecht University, uh, then did a postdoc in Stony Brook, moved further west to uh, University of California in Berkeley, where he was a Miller Fellow, I remember well. Uh, then returned to Holland on research positions at, uh, jointly between the Lorentz Center in Leiden and the Spinoza Center in Utrecht. Uh, and then he uh, moved to Amsterdam with, uh, in 2000, becoming full professor. Um, yeah, he has uh, done an amazing amount of scientific work in high energy theory, broadly defined, spanning from string theory to field theory, uh, gravity, here quantum gravity. Uh, in fact, also papers in condensed matter and, and fluid dynamics. So, and has a quite uh, broad profile. Uh, as other yeah, I find it also worthwhile to mention that Jan is currently a uh, member of the executive board of uh, NWO, that's uh, the Dutch pendant of Wetenschapsdroom, uh, and he's also chair of the domain science uh, within it. He's also a founding member of a very interesting initiative, in fact, uh, the international, it's an international initiative collecting different approaches to quantum gravity. So Jan, uh, together with others, is one of the founding members of that uh, society. It's called Is, is Quantum Gravity, the in International Society of Quantum Gravity. And then last but not least, I should also say, uh, he's recipient of uh, the ERC Advanced Grant, which he currently holds. Uh, and I think some of the results that Jan will be talking about were obtained in that context. So it's a great pleasure you made it to Stockholm, Jan, and uh, take it away. Uh, Thanks, Knut. Uh, so it's a great pleasure and a great honor to uh, tell you something about quantum gravity today. So this will be a somewhat uh, kaleidoscopic uh, type of colloquium with some bits and pieces here and there. It's unfortunately impossible to give a completely self-contained comprehensive lecture in an hour. But I'll uh, try my best to uh, sketch some of the recent developments and excitement in the field of quantum gravity. I think one of the things that's particularly exciting is that many interesting physics concepts and a few were mentioned in the title, namely quantum chaos and uh, complexity and also various aspects of statistical physics have all entered the field of quantum gravity in an interesting way. And many things that were originally developed in the context of quantum many body theory somehow for some reason show up in studies of quantum gravity. The very ambitious outline of this colloquium is as follows. So I'll start by making a few introductory remarks uh, about quantum gravity, why we care, why it's interesting. Then I'll say a few words about something that's called the AES-CFT correspondence. Um, I'll explain why it's useful to say a few words about that. The, the main reason to introduce that notion is that that is the context that gives us the most precise technical control. It doesn't necessarily mean that what one does there does not apply in other situations, but it's the, the, it's the, uh, the setting, it's the system where we have the maximal amount of technical control. Uh, and that's why it's a, it's a nice setting to discuss. And I'll sort of discuss three kind of puzzles that show up in uh, thinking about quantum gravity and also what our current understanding of those questions is. First one has to do with the role of Euclidean wormholes in quantum gravity. The second one uh, with the so-called information paradox. And the third one uh, with the fate of the infalling observer in the black hole. Um, so let me first make some introductory remarks about quantum gravity. And by the way, if you uh, have a question in the middle of the colloquium, by all means interrupt because it's nice to uh, have some questions during the presentation. So, um, as we know, um, general relativity, which is the classical theory of gravity, uh, describes the geometry of space and time as being dynamical rather than static. And recently, this has been shown experimentally by the ligo furco collaboration a couple of years ago, and they got the Nobel Prize for that. They measured gravitational waves. We saw ripples propagating in the fabric of space-time. Uh, and if nothing else, this is clear evidence that space and time are not static, they move. They are dynamical objects. Now, if you, that's great, that's fine. It's all classical physics. If you, however, combine that with quantum physics, and you couple 
some spacetime that moves to standard quantum physics, then inevitably uh, spacetime itself also has to somehow become quantum. That means, in particular, that rather than thinking about a single classical fluctuating spacetime, you should be thinking about quantum wave functions on spacetimes. Uh, and that uh, there's no sharp notion of space and time anymore. We should be thinking about wave functions on the set of spacetimes. And trying to make sense of that statement is basically one of the main goals of what's called quantum gravity. How do you even uh, begin to describe something like this? The problem is that if this is all a big quantum mass on short distance scales, uh, and everything fluctuates and you have wave functions, how do you even start to define, say, an observable? Because you don't have a well-defined point to define it. You just have a weird, uh, violent fluctuating mass of geometry. So it's very hard to sort of get started even on this. I'll say a bit more about it in a minute. Uh, now, because the world is quantum gravitational, it's gravitational and it's quantum, so in particular it's quantum gravitational, uh, it has always been a, a great challenge to come up with a consistent description of such a quantum gravitational theory. Uh, you might ask why we care. Well, uh, it's probably not very important for technology applications. Uh, to win wars and other useful things. Uh, but it's a very interesting intellectual challenge to try to understand what the theory is. It's also important, uh, if you ever want to fully understand the physics of black holes, that we have a full understanding of the theory of quantum gravity. And uh, similarly, it's important if you want to understand the origin of the universe, which started with the Big Bang, which is just a word describing um, some complicated quantum gravitational beginning of the universe where we don't have a precise technical description because we're in a regime where our current theories break down. Uh, and then maybe there's interesting surprises when we do so. Maybe if you understand quantum gravity, maybe it has interesting observational implications that we had not thought about before. Maybe it explains things in the universe uh, that we thought were not quantum but are in fact quantum. Um, and it's a very difficult thing to do it, because if you just start from general relativity as your starting point and you try to quantize the theory, uh, everything goes wrong. It's a non-renormalizable theory. Uh, so general relativity by itself is not a fundamental theory. It's only a low energy approximation to a fundamental theory. Um, and as I said before, it, it's very confusing if you start to think about a quantum geometry, how you even start to define an observable how you even define that to begin with. Uh, and as I said, black holes are particularly interesting and, and always pose an interesting challenge to any theory of quantum gravity. Sometimes it's called the harmonic oscillator of quantum gravity. Uh, and that's because there is this, uh, this is the cartoon of the black hole. There is a horizon here. There's a singularity at the bottom. Uh, and if you want to understand what happens to an infalling observer and also what, what the singularity means, we need a theory of quantum gravity because general relativity breaks down the singularity. <coughs> and you'll get a lovely colloquium on, uh, on black holes uh, in two weeks by Sarah Markov, I believe. So, there are a few lessons, uh, general lessons from the 1970s about black holes that are important to keep in mind. Uh, and those lessons um, are sometimes called the laws of black hole mechanics. And one important statement, in these are statements in classical general relativity. There's no quantum gravity here whatsoever. Uh, the first one is that black holes have no hair. That means that they are featureless. They have no substructure. Uh, the second statement is that black holes seem to carry an entropy, so they seem to have a certain intrinsic number of degrees of freedom. And you can compute how many degrees of freedom there are supposed to be, and you find that it's given by the area of the black hole horizon divided by four times the Newton constant. That's the famous Bekenstein-Hawking entropy formula. Moreover, uh, as Hawking showed, black holes in fact have a temperature. They radiate like a black body radiates pure black body radiation at a fixed temperature. Um, and putting all of this together, strongly suggests that these are all classical or semi-classical uh, observations. All of this strongly suggests that black holes are exactly like a thermodynamic system. They have a temperature, they have an entropy, they have an energy, etc. Now, one could say that this does not prove they are in fact 
thermodynamic systems. This is all just an analogy of some sort. Um, however, it is one of the main and central assumptions of uh, most research in quantum gravity that this is in fact a correct analogy and that we really should think of black holes as thermodynamic objects. If you drop that assumption, then uh, maybe one can do other things, but this assumption is, co is consistent with everything that we know. It's sometimes referred to as the central dogma. Um, so the information paradox, which is one of the most confusing things that has to do with black holes, has to do with this uh, Hawking radiation. Let me briefly describe what this paradox is. So if you have a black hole, Hawking showed that uh, if you just do semi-classical physics in the black hole background, that you have particles being created, particle pairs being created near the horizon. Uh, the cartoon picture is that one flies in and the other flies out. Uh, this is sort of vacuum particle production, if you want. Uh, and that these outgoing particles look to us like purely thermal radiation. And you can compute the temperature of that. This is a cartoon. It's a useful cartoon, but as with all cartoons, it's only an approximate cartoon, so you can take this too seriously. Uh, the computation is obviously much more precise and technical, and, uh, and the result is pretty much the same. Now, the, the issue with uh, this mechanism is that this particle creation here is causally completely independent from any other physics that happens somewhere else. It happens purely near the horizon. And because it's causally disconnected from things that happen anywhere else, this pair production mechanism does not know anything about the rest of the state of the universe. And therefore, in this computation, it looks like the radiation that comes out of the black hole is, is really purely 100% pure thermal radiation with a perfect Boltzmann distribution. And that leads to a sharp contradiction, which is called the information paradox, which states that if you start with a pure state, in quantum mechanics that describes, say, a large shell of matter or some other very massive object, you let it collapse into a black hole, you wait for the black hole to completely Hawking evaporate, then since the radiation that comes out is purely thermal radiation until the black hole becomes uh, like super, super small, uh, the final result is like a thermal state. It's a thermal mixture with Boltzmann weights of different states. And that's not a pure state, that's what in quantum mechanics is called a mixed state, because it's a linear superposition of states. Uh, and therefore, it would suggest that uh, unitarity is, is not working anymore, that uh, physics is no longer unitary, because this initial pure state, apparently time evolves in a mixed state. And this apparent violation of unitarity is what's called the information paradox. And in quantum mechanics, this never happens. If you start with a pure state, and you evolve as in quantum mechanics by e to the i t times the Hamiltonian, pure states always remain pure. Um, now, you might think that this is just because Hawking made some approximations, and if you would do a slightly more precise computation, maybe everything would be fine. But you can check that if you, if you modify in a somewhat naive way Hawking's computation, and you, for example, include higher order curvature corrections or some other modification of general relativity, it's not going to solve this problem. It will just give an epsilon correction to it, but it won't solve this fundamental problem. So to solve this fundamental problem, you need to do something more dramatic. Um, and the information paradox is the question what this more dramatic thing is. Because as it stands at this moment, this computation shows you that these things cannot all hold at the same time. If you assume these three things here, then there's a contradiction. So in quantum gravity, we have to either give up unitarity, which was the original proposal of Hawking. We should forget about standard quantum mechanics. We should come up with a new version of quantum mechanics that's not unitary and where pure states can time evolve into mixed states. Uh, or we have to give up locality somehow, which means that Somehow what happens here knows about what is happening very far away, although these two points are causally disconnected from each other. Or we have to get up essentially the equivalence principle and claim, for example, that as you are near the horizon of a black hole, there is some dramatic change of geometry, maybe there's like a, a, a big firewall that awaits all of us. If that were the case, that would also uh, sort of solve the apparent contradiction, but that's a very dramatic thing to propose, that once you 
across the horizon of a black hole that a big firewall awaits you. Uh, because in general relativity, there's really absolutely no reason why that should happen. Then the last thing I wanted to mention uh, from black holes is this equation for the entropy of a black hole, which is the Bekenstein Hawking entropy formula. It states that the, the entropy of a black hole is given by the area of the horizon divided by 4 times the Newton constant. Now, in any normal thermodynamic system, we normally have extensivity, which means that the free energy and the entropy scale with the volume. <coughs> and if you have a standard local theory, that is typically what happens. The fact that here entropy scales with the, with the area and not with the volume uh, tells you that there is some weird fundamental reorganization of the degrees of freedom going on. Uh, and that uh, quantum gravity is not an extensive theory. The number of degrees of freedom does not scale with the volume. It scales somehow with the area. <coughs> In particular, if you would take uh, USB sticks and you would put lots and lots of USB sticks on top of each other, you might think that you can uh, you know, keep on doing that. But eventually, if you put enough USB sticks together, the density of that pile of USB sticks will be large enough that this pile will collapse into a black hole. So you cannot keep on storing information volume by volume. At some point, you run into this thing that the density becomes uh, compatible with a black hole, and then the whole pile of USB sticks crashes into a black hole. And this general observation that the entropy scales with the area, not with the volume, and that quantum gravity is not extensive, uh, is known as the holographic uh, principle, which basically states, this is at Hoft and Susskind, who were the first to, who uh, proposed this idea, uh, is that somehow you should be able to project all the degrees of freedom of a quantum gravitational theory on a co-dimension one screen. So in three dimensions, we should be able to project all information on a two-dimensional screen because information, entropy, and everything, it scales with the area, not with the volume. Uh, now, how you do that technically is, is a very different question, but that is uh, what's known as the holographic principle. Um, so sometimes people draw this cartoon where you have a black hole and you have qubits on the horizon to indicate that uh, all the degrees of freedom, all the information is somehow living on the horizon of the black hole. So these were some introductory remarks. Um, and um, I will end each little block with a take-home message so that you can, uh, if you decoupled for a bit, you can uh, just read these bullet points and try to <coughs> catch on again. Uh, so if we write down a theory of quantum gravity, then ideally, uh, whatever theory you write down, it should first of all, in principle, explain the entropy of a black hole in terms of certain microscopic degrees of freedom, so that the entropy of the black hole is really counting degrees of freedom. It should ideally resolve this information paradox, tells us what has to give and how it has to give. It should tell us uh, what happens to an infalling observer. If we have a theory and we can compute things, we should be able to compute what happens to an infalling observer and whether that infalling observer will hit a firewall or not. It should be compatible with this holographic principle, with the non-extensivity of degrees of freedom. And it should explain also what happens at the Big Bang, at the black hole simulator. That's just some sort of risk list for a proper theory of quantum gravity. Now, in order to make some progress on all of this, we very often use something that's called the ADSCT correspondence. And why do we uh, introduce that? This is not historically how it was introduced, but I find it a useful perspective. So, because if you want to do quantum gravity and space-time fluctuates, it's very hard to even start to define the thing. How do you define an observable? There is no unambiguous notion of a space-time point if you, you know, superpose geometries. And so one way in which you can make progress is to put gravity in a box. Uh, and, and in some sort of box, you should think of this a little bit as a potential well, which has the property that this potential well has the property that quantum fluctuations, as you go towards the boundary, become smaller and smaller. And all the way sort of at the end point of this well, the, the fluctuations go to zero. If we can make such a uh, box in which we stick gravity, then although space-time here is wildly fluctuating, 
the fluctuations in space-time will become less and less and less as we go towards the boundary. And they might become zero precisely at the boundary. And that means that at the boundary, space-time no longer fluctuates. And we can actually define something there that is well defined. There is then an unambiguous notion of, of space and time at the boundary. And that's precisely what this thing called ABS is doing for you. It's a particular geometry. If you don't know what a metric is, it doesn't matter. It's some specific space-time geometry. That precisely, uh, and this e to the 2r is, is kind of giving you this potential well here, and that makes sure that things die out near the boundary. Uh, and you should maybe think of this as just a regulator of flat space, because things that happen at the bottom of the well don't really care about the existence of this potential. Locally here, everything just looks like flat space gravity. Uh, so this is just some sort of regulator, a very convenient regulator to sort of allow yourself to have a handle on fluctuating spacetimes. Uh, and that's why this is a very useful spacetime to have. Uh, a different picture is this thing here, uh, which shows you that uh, the geometry of this box is roughly uh, time goes up. It has some spatial slices. Uh, each colored triangle layer has exactly the same area. So you can see that as you go towards the boundary of the box, you get more and more and more triangles, so that the volume blows up near the boundary. Uh, but that's precisely the thing that gives you this effective potential <coughs> and makes sure that quantum fluctuations near the boundary die. And this is why uh, this box has a very nice boundary. Now, um, so the boundary here does not fluctuate. That's a fixed boundary. So we can put things on the boundary. And that's a well-defined thing to do. You could now even imagine that maybe, since the boundary is well-defined, that maybe uh, we can even define some sort of quantum system that lives on the boundary. Uh, and that turns out to be the right perspective. It is very crazy if you uh, make the statement that perhaps gravity inside this box is identical to a quantum system that lives on the boundary of the box. That sounds a priori completely crazy. How can uh, a, a system that lives in d dimensions be equivalent to a system that lives in d minus 1 dimensions? But that's precisely the statement of what's known as the ASC of t correspondence, is that this is in fact true. And by simply studying semi-classical physics in this box, you can find a lot of evidence that this is in fact true. Uh, ASCFT was originally found in the context of string theory, but many, many features of ASCFT don't rely string theory at, on string theory at all. They can be derived based on general semi-classical principles. So one important uh, way in which we can see that maybe it's not so crazy that there is something living only on the boundary is because the Hamiltonian of general relativity <coughs> is a very strange Hamiltonian because it's equal to zero. Uh, that sounds very weird because clearly in space-time moves you did not have a Hamiltonian. Uh, yes, but the actual Hamiltonian, if you work it out to zero, up to boundary terms. That so strongly suggests that all the dynamics in general relativity can be described purely in terms of boundary information. It's maybe a bit like, uh, for those who know the quantum Hall effect, quantum Hall effect it can be described by a topological field theory. Uh, but if you put it on a system with a boundary, you get chiral uh, edge modes on the boundary. Uh, it's almost a bit like this. We have, in some sense, gravity is a topological theory. But if you put it on a system with a box, you get edge modes. And all these things that live on the edge of the box, they, they make up some quantum system on the boundary of this box, on the boundary of ABS. The other reason why, obviously, it's very nice to lose a dimension is, is that this is exactly what the holographic principle is telling which should happen. Uh, it said that uh, degrees of freedom in quantum gravity are not extensive. They go with the area, not with the volume. But if you lose a dimension by going to the boundary, then from the boundary point of view, uh, it's perfect extensivity, because the boundary has one dimension less. So not only is it, in principle, consistent with everything that we know, that gravity in this box is exactly equivalent to a quantum field theory or some quantum system on the boundary, uh, it's also compatible with the holographic principle. <coughs> and so it's a feature, not a bug, that we have this boundary that has one dimension left. 
Now again, as I said, without going into detail, so I'll skip a few things, um, you can easily argue that whatever this quantum system is, that it must have a long list of properties in order for the story to be consistent. And this list is longer, and you can derive these properties, you don't need string theory or anything like that, all you need is semi-classical <coughs> semi relativity. You can argue for a long list of properties of the field theory for this story to be compatible. And then you can ask, is there, are there actually examples of quantum systems that, that satisfy all these, all these requirements? Uh, and the answer is yes, because such quantum systems were found and identified uh, in the context of string theory. You can derive examples of this in string theory. Uh, and in string theory, you can argue that there are very precise examples where you know exactly what the gravitational theory is, and you know exactly what the quantum system on the boundary is. Uh, and there is an incredible amount of overwhelming evidence that these two things are exactly identical to each other. And even if you don't want to buy into that, uh, all these arguments strongly suggest that this should be true anyway. Now these field, these, these quantum systems that live on these boundaries of these boxes, they have all kinds of interesting properties, but one important property is that they are very complicated because they have a coupling constant and they tend to be strongly coupled, which means that it's very hard to do computations in these theories. The quantum systems that we can compute in typically are free theories plus small perturbations. And then we can do perturbation theory around the free theory. These theories are not like that. They're not free theories with a small perturbation. They are free theories with a large perturbation. And um, you need to resum perturbation theory to infinite order in order to do a reliable computation. Again, that's in some sense a good thing because there was something very weird must happen for a five and a four dimensional theory or a four and a three dimensional theory to be equal to each other. If you could do easily computations in both, they look very different. So it better be true that computations in one of the two uh, theories is very difficult. Uh, otherwise this could never be true because they're so obviously different from each other. Um, so, so ADS, um, this is my take home message of uh, this second little part, is that uh, so quantum gravity in ADS in this box is equivalent to a quantum system that lives on this boundary. Those two things are exactly the same. Uh, and the fact that we have this exact quantum system on the boundary is the reason why we have been able to make so much progress uh, in studying quantum gravity in this box. You can get many of the properties of this quantum system just from semi-classical reasoning and general physics arguments. Uh, but if you want a more detailed and a more precise and exact mathematical statement, uh, then you have to go to string theory and you get very precise examples, but they all agree with the general semi-classical lessons that one can derive anyway. Now, to compute something, you can only put things on the boundary of this box. That's the only place where you can put stuff. Uh, so one thing that you can do is you can put operators. There's a precise recipe I want to explain. You can put operators on the boundary of this box. And now you can do a computation where you compute a correlation function of these operators. There's two possible computations you can do. You can try to do this computation in directly in the quantum system on the boundary. That's a very complicated quantum system, and it's in practice almost impossible to do these computations, unless you have some extra symmetries or so. Or you just use the gravitational description to do the computation. That should be equivalent. The quantum system is equivalent to the gravitational theory. And if you do the gravitational computation, you just have to do some, what looks like a Feynman diagram uh, in the geometry with some propagators and vertices. But the, the interesting thing is these operators, we can only put them on the boundary because that's the only uh, location where space and time are well defined. So if you look at this diagram, it's a bit like shooting rays through the, in, through the region in the middle. So the way we try to understand quantum gravity here looks a bit like medical uh, imaging because the only thing we can do is we can put things on the boundary, we can shoot rays through the middle, and then from that information we have to reconstruct what is actually going on there. So it's a bit like doing an MRI of gravity. 
Um, and as I said, if you were able to compute these correlation functions directly, you might have recognized that they kind of look like something that lives in one dimension higher. But because it's so difficult to do these computations, this was never done. Uh, so sometimes we use the slogan here that uh, space-time is emergent. Because if you think about what is this radial direction that goes from the boundary into the box, that is precisely uh, a direction that corresponds to scale transformations and the scale of energy in the, in the quantum system. Um, so it's almost like what you do here is you take this quantum system, uh, but you sort of geometrize is the scale in the, in the theory, like the energy scale, you make it geometric. And that gives you this extra dimension. So this extra dimension is literally something like the scale of the theory. Uh, and this is why one sometimes says that this is an emergent space-time, because the fifth dimension arises in an indirect way from the scale of the, of the quantum system. Uh, another thing you can compute uh, is partition functions. The partition function of the system on the boundary at finite temperature is very difficult to compute because it's a very difficult system. It should be equal to some gravitational computation. Uh, then what you do is you take this is your boundary, uh, then you look at whatever geometry connects to that boundary. This is again my box. It looks a bit different, but it's still a box. Uh, and then all you need to do is uh, compute the, uh, the volume of this cigar, and then you can compute the partition function of that, uh, that theory of the boundary. So a very complicated computation of the partition function reduces to computing essentially an area in some geometry. So something very complicated is equal to something very easy. Um, another surprise that came out of all of this uh, has to do with the, the strange role that quantum information plays. Uh, it, from a philosophical point of view, uh, it, it's an interesting question why quantum information shows up in this context. Um, yeah, maybe, as I wrote, maybe one explanation is that uh, since gravity has so many features in it that look like it's really secretly a thermodynamic theory, that anything that has a bit of a thermodynamic or an entropic interpretation somehow seems to have a nice uh, interpretation in this context. And quantum information is an example of such a thing. Uh, so what's quantum information? This is a very heuristic description. Uh, but suppose that one has a state that's entangled, like this one. This is an EPR pair or a Bell pair. So it's a linear superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. Uh, and entanglement is the thing that makes quantum physics different from classical physics. Uh, because, because quantum systems have entanglement, uh, the results of measurements in two causally disconnected uh, uh, regions can be correlated. Right? If you have an EPR pair and you separate it by 10 light years and you measure the qubit there and simultaneously the qubit there, you get correlated outcomes. If that's zero, that one is zero. If that's one, you know that that one will be one. And there cannot have been any communication between those two instances because they were widely separated. Classically, that cannot happen. You cannot have such correlated outcomes uh, if you only have classical physics. Now, if you have two systems, an A and a B system, you can try to uh, write down a, a quantity which is called entanglement entropy. But what it does, it roughly tells you how many of such bell pairs are shared between A and B. So if A and B uh, have five bell pairs shared between them, then times and be something like five or so. Uh, so it's, it's a rough estimate of the number of bell pairs that you have between A and B. Now, the weird thing is that in this context of uh, A, C, and B, and, and this gravity in a box situation, is that gravity geometrizes quantum information. A very difficult, if you have this quantum system on the boundary, and you separate the quantum system on the boundary in a spatial region B and a spatial region A, and you ask how many bell pairs are there that are shared between A and B, so those are roughly quantum bell pairs that sort of correlate A and B together, 
Uh, you can take a quantum system and try to compute this. These are very difficult computations, even in free theories. If you take some region A and its complement, and you ask how many bell pairs are there between A and its complement, even in the vacuum, it's a very difficult computation. But the amazing statement is that if you uh, do ADS-CFT, is that the number of bell pairs is geometrized. It's given by the area of some minimal surface. So you simply, you know, you have this big box here that contains some space-time geometry. All you need to do is uh, attach a surface to the region that separates A and B. You minimize the area of that surface. And then the number of bell pairs between A and B is given by the area of that surface divided by 4G which is the Newton constant. And that equation looks exactly like the equation for black hole entropy, the bekenstein hawking entropy formula, which was also that the entropy of a black hole was A over 14. Although these equations look similar and they are closely related to each other, they are in fact conceptually slightly different from each other. Uh, and it's remarkable that in this way, a very difficult computation of the numbers of bell pairs is related to some geometry. Uh, and that's really surprising. Uh, and why fundamentally gravity likes to geometrize quantum information is it, still a bit of a mystery. Uh, something even more general that you can say is that you need entanglement, uh, that that's a crucial building block to even have space time to begin with. So there is a general statement that if you describe quantum states that do not have entanglement, that the corresponding space-time descriptions will never be connected. Uh, so there's something very fundamental about the connection between entanglement and the fabric of space-time. But the precise relation is still not known what that is. So that is the uh, final bullet point. Um, there is a, uh, maybe a general suggestion that maybe uh, one should be able to reformulate gravity in purely information theoretic terms, because there are many, many other concepts from quantum information theory and quantum computing that have a nice geometric interpretation in gravity. Uh, so you almost feel like there should be a purely information theoretic way to think about space-time, but that formulation has not been quite found yet. Now, um, before briefly going through these puzzles, uh, I want to briefly say something about black holes in ADS. Because what's a black hole in ADS? You just take this box and you put a black hole in it. That's it. Uh, now, you can ask what the description in terms of this quantum system on the boundary is. Uh, and it turns out to be very simple, because in the boundary theory, all you need to do is to heat up the boundary theory. So if you... Uh, the statement is that quantum gravity in this box is given by a quantum system on the boundary. And this particular excitation in this gravitational theory, which is described by a black hole, is just in this quantum system described by simply heating of the quantum system. So a finite temperature quantum system is given by a black hole in the box. A zero temperature quantum system is given by no black hole in the same box. Um, and these black holes have very interesting properties. Um, some of which are mentioned here. Uh, but there's a nice translation between uh, features of the black hole and things that happen in the quantum system. So suppose you have a black hole in this box and you throw something into the black hole. Now what happens on the gravitational side? Uh, it's a little bit like a little black hole mer merger. You throw something into the black hole, it will ring back and forth for a while, and then it will settle down. If you do something like that from the quantum system, uh, you perturb the quantum system at finite temperature. It's like perturbing a fluid. Because it's just a quantum system at finite temperature, it's described by some thermodynamics. So you perturb the fluid. Well, if you perturb the fluid, it will also ring back and forth for a while, but then you know, the perturbation will dissipate, and the fluid will come to rest again. Uh, and that is the precise quantum mechanical description uh, of throwing something into the black hole. But one very important feature uh, of black hole physics is that they are amazingly chaotic. 
So what does it mean to say that the black hole is very chaotic? So this is a slightly technical slide. I wanted to maybe explain it briefly. Uh, so suppose, uh, let's first talk about classical chaos. So classical chaos is the statement that if you start in some classical dynamical system with two initial conditions that are very close to each other, that as you evolve in time, that those trajectories will diverge exponentially. If they diverge exponentially as a function of time, and there is some parameter lambda here that's called the Lyapunov exponent, this is classical chaotic behavior. Because this means that uh, very soon you will lose predictability of what, ha what is happening. Like the weather is an example of this and so on. Right? This is classical chaos. Uh, it's an interesting question and still somewhat open question what the precise quantum definition of chaos is. So if I give you a quantum system, how, how should one define quantum chaos? Now, one quantum counterpart of this classical computation is given by a little computation here where you examine the change of the coordinates at this moment in time uh, as you vary the initial condition. You write this for some bracket and the commutator. And then you see that um, what corresponds to something like this in a quantum system are correlation functions of this time. And these correlation functions are called out of time ordered correlators, also known as OTOGs. And they're an interesting tool in, uh, also in quantum many body theory because out of time ordered correlators, uh, they also have interesting exponential time dependence and they have a quantum version of the Lyapunov exponent in them. So you can study a quantum counterpart of classical chaos by studying these out of time ordered correlators. And they're out of time ordered because you can see the times are not ordered. You go have an operator at t, 1 at 0, 1 at t, and 1 at 0. It was shown in this paper by Mondesay and Shanker Stanford in 2015 that this Lyapunov exponent in quantum systems cannot be arbitrary. It has to be bounded by 2 pi divided by the inverse temperature. So B is always 1 over the temperature. Uh, and they also showed that for black holes, you precisely saturate this bound. Uh, and you do that by, uh, by basically computing this out of time or the correlator in the black hole background, where it effectively is a scattering experiment that you do very close to the horizon of the black hole. Uh, and because when you go very close to the horizon of the black hole, there's a large blue shift. The blue shift that you see close to the horizon of a black hole is the thing that gives this exponential growth. Uh, so black holes are the most chaotic thing that exists in nature. There's nothing more chaotic than the strongest chaotic things that you can imagine. Uh, so that's a remarkable feature of black holes which will be important in a little while. Um, then the last ingredient, and then I'll briefly go to the three puzzles and I'll be done, that I want to mention is since these black holes are so chaotic, it in particular means that if you throw in a perturbation, this perturbation will scramble through the system very rapidly, and after a relatively short time, the system will have equilibriated again. If you take any quantum system and you perturb it, the amount of time it takes for the system to scramble that information and to pretty much look like the original system again is called the scrambling time. And you can, for a black hole, compute it, and it's something like beta times the log of the entropy. Uh, from a gravitational point of view, that is basically the time it takes for something that you throw into the black hole to reach the horizon at Planck distance away from it. Now, uh, many difficult and important problems that have to do with black holes and so on have to do with what happens after this scrambling time. So it might look like there's nothing left and the black hole just looks like a black hole, but we know that at a fundamental microscopic level, there are still things happening. And a very important question is what are the computational tools that we have available to examine quantum systems that you perturb, they scramble, and uh, basically the, the information is kind of lost. From the point of view of simple observables, it, it looks like you know, the, the, the perturbation has disappeared. Are there any tools left to still examine the quantum system after the scrambling time? And one tool 
that seems to be able to do that is something called computational complexity. This is the definition of comp computational complexity. Uh, it looks a bit complicated, uh, but it comes really from uh, quantum computing. And it's not such a difficult definition because it simply states that suppose you have some reference state that's fixed, psi naught. You have a set of gates, which are just a bunch of unitary operators. Those are, in quantum computing terms, just the things that you can make in your quantum computer device. Uh, and suppose you have some different state psi. The question is, what is the smallest number of gates that you need to apply to my reference state uh, to, to get very close to my different state? Um, so you simply start with your initial state and you apply some quantum gates and then at some point you get very close to the state of interest. So in this case the complexity of state psi will be 6 because we used up 6 unitaries. Uh, assuming this is the shortest path, it doesn't look like it, but suppose it is. Suppose this is the shortest path, then uh, the complexity of the state psi will be 6. Now, now in black hole backgrounds, um, there's also something that keeps on growing for a long time even after you throw something in, which is the volume of a constant time slice. Uh, so that has led to the suggestion, because um, you can argue that this complexity, this definition of complexity here, you can argue that this one, uh, this quantity, is one of the few quantities that keeps on growing with time, even after a system has thermalized. Because if a system has thermalized, it does not mean it has already completely explored all the possible microstates of the system. It takes a long time, even after you thermalize the system, to explore all the degrees of freedom of the system. And complexity keeps track of that exploration of the Hilbert space. And this is the reason why it is something that is more refined than, say, the expectation value of the energy or a two-point correlator or something like that. Because those will not see anything anymore at some point. But this keeps track of your exploration of the full Hilbert space of the system. And since it keeps on growing for a long time, there was a suggestion that maybe complexity equals volume. That there's a relation between the complexity of a state and the volume of some slice in space-time. But so far, it has not been uh, possible to make it mathematically precise. So the take-home message here is that black holes are extremely chaotic. They're the most chaotic objects known to us. Um, that in particular means that the spectrum of the quantum system, because a finite temperature quantum system is what describes the black hole, so the degrees of freedom of that finite temperature quantum system must be very dense and chaotic as well. Uh, and that means that it's very difficult because of this highly chaotic nature to, to probe black holes after a scrambling time. Once you throw something in and you wait a little while, it's extremely difficult to probe black holes. And the only sort of quantity that we know that has a chance of probing black holes is this thing called complexity. Then in the remaining 10 minutes, I briefly go through three little puzzles and how they relate to some of the things I just said. The first puzzle has to do with Euclidean wormholes. Um, this is where the remaining thing from the title, namely statistical physics, will show up. <coughs> so, the so-called puzzle is hollow. Suppose we take two finite temperature quantum systems that are here indicated by a circle. Uh, so if you have quantum mechanics at finite temperature, uh, you can always describe it by uh, making time imaginary and periodic. Because then the e to the i t h becomes e to the minus tau h, and then you replace tau by beta, and then you have the Boltzmann weight e minus beta h. So here is a finite temperature quantum system. Here is two of them. Uh, so this is a box, not with one boundary. This is a box with two boundaries. And it turns out that you can have boxes with two boundaries. They look like a Euclidean wormhole because, you know, the picture is very suggestive. There is an actual tunnel that goes from one side to the other. But there's no time here. Uh, so you, this is Euclidean signature, so there's no time here. It's just a spatial geometry. Um, but this is uh, what's called Euclidean wormhole. They have nothing to do with time travel because for that you need a Lorentzian wormhole. Uh, and time travel doesn't exist anyway. So this is uh, 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 a 
a Euclidean configuration. But it's very strange because we were saying that a gravitational theory is the same as a quantum system. Here there are two quantum systems, but it looks like they're not independent from each other because they're connected by this geometry. And that suggests that there is correlations between those quantum systems. Now you can have correlations by entangling things, but that's again uh, not relevant here because it's all Euclidean. And this is called the factorization puzzle. There should be two independent quantum systems that should not be talking to each other. Yet, we have this hormonal configuration that seems to suggest they do talk to each other. So what is going on? Uh, state differently, uh, if you want to compute the product of two partition functions, you have this particular box, this uh, contribution from two disconnected boxes, and then there's the contribution from the connected box, which is this wormhole. Uh, but if you compute the product of one point functions, you just have these two disconnected boxes. So this is what I meant by uh, the thing not factorizing. Uh, and these, in principle, if, if this is a partition function of a single quantum system, this is just a number. It's some number. And the product of two numbers is equal to the product of two numbers. So for some reason, uh, there's something very strange here. Now, suppose that uh, a gravitational theory would not be dual to a single quantum system, but it would be dual to a sum over quantum systems, like, say, a sum over disorder parameters or something like that. Yes? Excuse me. What does it mean, averaging a partition function? It doesn't mean anything. That's why it's very strange. So, so if, however, uh, this uh, partition function would depend on a disorder parameter. Then you could imagining, uh, then you could imagine averaging of. Oh, I'm not supposed to stand here. Sorry. Then you could imagine averaging of the disorder parameter, and then it would mean something to average. Uh, but if you don't have a disorder parameter, then there's nothing to average. So therefore, this equation a priori looks ridiculous. And and the puzzle is to explain where this apparent discrepancy or disagreement comes from and what it means. If you have a disorder parameter like here, then this is perfectly fine, right? So if, if by this, this correlation function you mean summing over some disorder parameter, then it can be true that this is not equal to that. Uh, and since you have these Euclidean wormholes, it has been suggested that maybe, you know, uh, we should never try to describe a gravitational theory in terms of a single quantum system, but always in terms of some disorder effort system. Uh, and this goes back to discussions of, uh, of so-called baby universes by, uh, particularly by uh, Sidney Coleman a couple of decades ago. But there's a different perspective on what's going on, uh, which is as follows. These wormholes are described in, in, in a semi-classical gravitational theory, uh, but that's, a, that's an approximate theory, and in particular, it cannot see the individual microscopic degrees of freedom of a black hole. So it's like statistical physics. Um, you only have some partial information of the system. Uh, in particular, if you want to, the canonical ensemble, for example, is obtainable by just fixing the energy of a system and then asking for the, the, the state of maximal entropy. Uh, and similarly here, we have limited information available, and in the spirit of statistical physics, if you have limited information, the best possible description of the system that you can give is given by um, a matrix model where you average over all, uh, basically the matrices, you should think of them as Hamiltonians, where you average over all Hamiltonians that are compatible with your low energy observations. That's the best description you can have, because you cannot distinguish those Hamiltonians. Uh, and this philosophy was successfully applied, for example, by Wigner in 1955, where he used random matrix theory to describe the spectrum of heavy nuclei. The same spirit applies. You don't know the details of the Hamiltonian, so you average over a suitable set of Hamiltonians, and from that average you can compute average properties of the spectrum of nuclei. Uh, so what you do, is you propose that the semi-classical theory, this is not the full theory, it's just the low energy part of the theory, but that in fact is described not by a single Hamiltonian, 
is described by an average over all the Hamiltonians that are indistinguishable for low energy observers. So it's some sort of matrix model like structure. And, and if you assume that this equation, this equality is true, then the wormhole is simply measuring uh, this difference in this ensemble. Because now we are averaging over something, so now you can have a, a difference between the average of the product versus the product of the averages. Uh, this might sound like a strange thing to do, because normally we never in, in quantum field theory postulate that some low energy thing is dual to a statistical average. But you can actually test this equation, you can compute these measures, and you can check whether this equation holds. Um, and it seems to work. So it seems to be the case that all these weird Euclidean normals, they're sort of an artifact of our ignorance. They're just a result of us not having a complete description. And we did a lot of work uh, testing this in different cases, where we could do explicit computations. Uh, and we have collected by now quite a lot of evidence that this is the right way sorry, to think about the, this is the right interpretation of, uh, of semi-classical gravity. It's not a single Hamiltonian. It's not the low energy sector of, of a single theory. Uh, Semi-classical gravity is the statistical average of all Hamiltonians that are compatible with your low energy observations. Um, let me skip that. So um, that was the resolution of the wormhole puzzle. Uh, and it kind of explains many strange puzzling features of wormholes. Uh, and I should emphasize this is different, different from averaging, because if you Average, you do it always, but here the statement is that as you make more and more measurements and you uh, measure more and more things, this distribution over the space of Hamiltonians gets more and more squeezed, and in the limit of infinite accuracy, you're left with just a single Hamiltonian. So that's different here from uh, what I said. Uh, but one interesting little open problem is that if you go to a full UV complete description, where we should have a single quantum system, then somehow the contributions from these wormholes should disappear. Uh, and most likely that happens because they uh, become unstable in, in the full UV theory. And if you want to ask me more about it, you can do it later. Uh, almost done. The information paradox. The upshot of the solution is that you can... <coughs> this, was the, this was the problem. You start with a pure state, you end up with a mixed state. This is, the con this is sort of the conflict. Uh, you can do an interesting computation that uses some semi-classical path integrals. You don't need a full microscopic description. You only need some semi-classical path integrals to figure out uh, that actually this, if you do it correctly, does go into a pure state. <coughs> but the question was, what's the mistake? What is going wrong here? And, uh, I can give you, show you this picture, but it will take a long time to explain what this picture means, but this is uh, representative of some semi-classical gravitational computation that you need to do in order to see that pure states evolve into pure states. But this is the upshot uh, of all these computations in a cartoon way. This was the wrong answer. This is a mixed state. What happens is that uh, if you do the computation correctly, uh, what happens is that this mixed state that you get a large number of exponentially small corrections and you fill out all the other entries in this matrix, like this is just a you know, density matrix in quantum mechanics, you fill out all these other entries. Uh, so this is an exponentially small correction on this. There's many exponentially small pieces here, but it's really an exponentially small correction on this. And this thing here is a pure state, if you think about it. Uh, and <coughs> This looks a bit crazy, maybe, uh, but this is the essence of how the mixed state becomes a pure state. And if you translate this back into the mistake that Harking made, well, he made no mistake, but all these little e to the minus s entries here, they all correspond to extremely small, non-local effects in your effective theory <coughs> that conspire <coughs> to spit out the pure state at the end. So the thing that had to give is locality. However, locality has been sacrificed in an absolutely minimalistic way, because you will never see any violation of locality whatsoever if you're a low energy observer. 
if you wanted to see a violation of locality, you would have to do some very complicated measurement with a device that a low energy observer cannot build. However, fundamentally, there is a very mild, very mild, exponentially small violation of locality that turns this mixed state into a pure state at the end of the day. Um, and as I said, you have to give a strict locality. And in the last minute, uh, I wanted to say take four. Minutes. Four. Wow. Well, thank you. So, in the last four minutes, uh, I want to say one or two things about the infalling observer. Um, and why is it so difficult, even if we have this precise ADS-CFT description, with a black hole in the middle and the quantum system on the boundary, why is it so difficult to say anything about the role of the infalling observer? That has, in some sense, to do with, with the fact that from a boundary point of view, from this quantum system point of view, the observer goes towards the black hole, but once this observer gets extremely close to the horizon of the black hole, a Planck distance away from the horizon, it, from the outside you already lost all information about the observer. It has been completely scrambled over the quantum system. And if you then still want to say something about the nature of the observer, you have to somehow go beyond simple probes, because from a superficial point of view, your system has completely thermalized. It's like throwing a stone in the water, seeing the waves dissipate. At some point the waves are gone, but you know that somehow, somewhere in the quantum system of the water molecules, there is still a memory of the stone that went in. You just don't see it anymore uh, if you just look at it with long wavelength observations, because those have died away. Uh, and what we want for this infalling observer is a very detailed probe, which is a bit like seeing how the stone that we threw in the water, how, how we want to extract its information from the quantum state of the molecules. Uh, and that, that, that's why it's difficult. Another reason why it's difficult is that although you can construct things that look like operators behind the horizon of a black hole, you don't know whether these operators are in fact local operators. There is a large, weird, unitary ambiguity in this reconstruction of physics behind the horizon. Uh, because correlation functions of operators, if you conjugate everything by a unitary, nothing changes. And if U is a complicated operator that maps local to very complicated non-local operators, uh, these correlation functions don't change. So, with a lot of effort, in a paper from a couple of months ago, we were able to go through a long series of steps that I won't explain in detail. Uh, but at the end of the day, we found that you can reconstruct, uh, as far as we can see, the inside, what happens to an infalling observer. But to really do it, we do need a, a suitable notion of complexity. Uh, and this is because right now the only diagnostic that we have that probes features of a quantum system after the quantum system has thermalized, for, uh, as far as long wavelength observers go, uh, is this notion of complexity. And we could argue that regardless of the details of that notion, if we have such a notion of complexity, we could in fact reconstruct what happens to the involving observer. But it's a long series of steps that one needs to execute. Uh, so this, in principle, uh, provides a framework to study the fate of the infalling observer. <coughs> and it's very important that uh, in this entire program we never assumed any a priori knowledge of the inside geometry. Almost all other papers that are written about the inside of the black hole, they, they always assume an a priori geometry there, and then they do some self-consistency check. But what you want to do is do uh, not assume anything, and, and here we did not assume anything. We are sort of constructing step by step the geometry, and we also have a diagnostic for when this description breaks down. And this has to be the scaling with the Newton constant. Um, and I think if you go through all of this, um, the most likely outcome is that if you just make a black hole and you fall in, that in general you won't see anything special, there will not be a firewall near the horizon, there's no reason for it to be there. Uh, and as I said, because black holes are so chaotic, it appears almost inevitable that we use this concept of complexity here. So this is basically uh, the, the, the checklist that I showed at the beginning. So with putting gravity in the box and using a variety of tools from statistical physics, quantum information, uh, quantum chaos, uh, complexity and so on, we are more or less here right now. 
uh, especially with the two orange check marks, there's still something to be said. This is roughly where we are. Uh, and you know that uh, basically we have still not seen any sign of these individual microscopic degrees of freedom. Uh, we know they're there because we have this quantum system, but we still haven't seen any sign of these things. Uh, if you wanted to see actual, the, the actual atoms of space-time, you would need to do certain computations and see these individual wiggles here. But we have never seen uh, these wiggles in any sort of gravitational computation so far. Uh, so it seems like uh, you know, gravity simply does not see these individual microscopic degrees of freedom. It sees some features of them, but it doesn't see the individual wiggles, it doesn't see the individual microscopic degrees of freedom. Um, and one conclusion you can draw from this is that um, gravity is, is somehow a theory that's maximally efficient in hiding its quantum nature from low energy observations. It's maximally chaotic, uh, and the more chaotic it is, the more difficult it is to probe a system. And it seems that gravity is the most extreme version of that. Um, although I did use string theory a little bit here and there, I think you can almost run everything that we said without really relying on string theory. Uh, as you said, there's a remarkable interplay between quantum information theory, uh, complexity, quantum chaos, statistical physics, and uh, lots of other fun theoretical physics here. And I'll stop there and leave you with the conclusions. Thank you. Thank you a lot, uh, Jan, for this wonderful talk. I see a question in my hand. Nice to be able to kickstart the discussion. Thank you. Um, that's very interesting. You referred a lot to thermodynamics, microstates, etc. I think one of your collaborators had a more radical suggestion that gravity was entropic in nature and that you shouldn't quantize gravity. Could you comment on that? Ah, uh, yeah. I think you're referring to uh, my neighbor at the institute. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think there, there is a philosophical part to that statement that uh, somehow uh, uh, systems organize themselves to uh, maximize entropy. And some features of gravity definitely do that. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the more detailed implementation, like a technically precise detailed implementation of that idea is still uh, lagging. So I sympathize with the philosophy. Uh, I did at some point spend a bit of time trying to, in this ADS-CFT correspondence, see if one can make a more precise version of the statement, but uh, I, I failed to do so. Uh, so. So for the time being, this is, this is an, an interesting thought, it's an interesting idea, uh, but uh, it has not been lifted to a technically precise level yet. So turning it around, do you have strong arguments for why gravity should be quantized? Ex except that everything should be quantized. Yeah, no, well, that, this, this, uh, uh, if you do not quantize gravity, um, then to the best of our current understanding, I think you run into inconsistencies. Uh, so the standard equation that you write down if you don't quantize gravity is that you write that the uh, Einstein tensor is the expectation value of the stress tensor. That's a mixed classical quantum uh, equation. Uh, as far as we understand that equation is ultimately inconsistent with general physical principles. Uh, so that's the main reason why we think gravity should be quantized. Eric. Uh, thank you. Um, there was a, I, I'm a statistical physicist, but I think that's okay, because you have uh, asked questions. I was a bit lost on your questions, on, on, on your slides on the time scales. You had uh, the lacuna of exponent, which maybe, if I got it right, scale linearly mass of the black hole, and then you have the scrambling time, but I'm not sure uh, how that scales with the mass of the black hole. I missed that. Oh, sorry, the... Uh, uh, now you, had, you, you had one time, time, scrambling time, but then you also had the lacuna of exponent, which is inverse, uh, inverse time. So how do they scale with mass of the black hole? Um, In your theory or theories? Well, yeah, here, here's one, yeah. the Lyapunov exponent is simply proportional to the temperature. Okay. So this doesn't scale well to the extent that the mass and the temperature are related to each other, but the real uh, scales with the temperature. Okay. 
And the scrambling time. So that's linear real mass. Yeah? Uh, well, yeah, that depends on uh, the dimension, but yeah, uh, it's okay. uh, the, the temperature is here is not linear in the mass. Ah, so it's not like a standard working temperature. But temperature is inverse proportional to mass. So beta, beta is inverse temperature, that's linear mass. Okay, but that was the well, other time. I think. The, but the other one, uh, yeah, but okay, the, the sort of small, uh, I was thinking about a slightly different convention, but that's correct. The other one is also, there is a beta there, but it's a, a log S as well. Okay. So, so the that's log arithmetic mass. Log S is log in mass. Yeah, so this is more like an M log M type of thing. The other, uh, yeah, that's the Thank difference you. between them. Yeah. Uh, uh, I have a question about the previous slide also. So here, when you are saying that there is a maximal Lyapunov exponent, that is based on an averaging over a thermal ensemble. That's it, yeah. So if there is a non-thermal system for which there are many non-thermal systems for which we calculate Lyapunov exponent, then this bound has no relevance there. That's right. Um, this was derived for a thermal system. I think you can uh, uh, try to argue that it also holds in other states. The thing is that you have to sort of find some parametric region where you can actually control some, uh, where you have, where you sort of can control the scales in the problem. So this this can only be proven in this way if your theory has something like an n, and you can take a large n limit. But also you have a temperature, and you can have systems where you can't have a temperature. Oh, you can. Yeah, that's right. But I think the bound also holds in ge general states, not just in thermal states. But I don't know if that has been completely proven. <coughs> like from a gravitational point of view, uh, the most extreme scattering that you can do is near a black hole horizon. Uh, so from a gravitational perspective, uh, I cannot think of any other gravitational background which is not thermal and not a some state. I cannot think of anyone that would have a, a, a larger Lyapunov exponent. So from a gravitational point of view, uh, I, I think this statement is fine in any state, not just in the thermal state. Whether you can prove it in abstract quantum mechanics in any state is something I, I don't exactly know. Okay. Uh, by the way, the, the, the mic ran out of battery. So please repeat any question for the audience. Okay, but I, I uh, okay. Ask the question, please repeat. Yes, so as, as an experimentalist, I wonder whether any of the things that you have shown us will be sometime in the future experimentally observable. What mm -hmm. observables that I could, you know, we have not gravitational wave astronomy. Is there anything we might see? Um, I think. Uh, my current uh, honest opinion is that in, in the universe, no. Uh, I don't think we will soon see any sign of uh, actual quantum gravity up there. You might be able, but for example, there's different types of quantum problems. For example, you can ask whether a, uh, a graviton has a wave function, but that's a perturbative statement, and uh, that in some sense we believe to be true, and maybe it's testable in tabletop experiments and so on, and, uh, I don't know. But um, there's definitely people trying that. But you can really probe these fully quantum gravitational things and any reasonable time scale is much less likely to me. What can be done, you can also try to take another point of view. So there is an equivalence, that there is a claimed equivalence between a quantum system and a gravitational system. One thing that has been done not so long ago is uh, people try to make a quantum system in the lab that is believed to have a approximate equivalent gravitational description. And they show that some of the, uh, then it becomes a question of semantics, uh, like the slogan was there's a wormhole in the lab. It is just that you have a quantum system but it has an equivalent gravitational description. And then typically we use the description that's the most easy one, right? Uh, but it's two different descriptions that are both valid. Uh, they did some measurement where, they, uh, where the simplest explanation of the outcome was that they have two quantum systems. Uh, they, pre they prepared it in some state. They did some perturbation on one side, and you sort of see the, saw the perturbation come out on the other side. You can explain it all in just quantum mechanical terms, but the simplest explanation was to use the auxiliary gravitational description. So this is sort of going the other way. This, has a, this is a really fun uh, quantum experiment that has been done, yeah. inspired by this development. Thank you. 
So in that context, uh, I guess they have um, control on the Hamiltonian in the lab. So how does the wormhole appear there? If the wormholes appear when you average over Hamiltonian? Well, you don't need... Uh, um, you don't necessarily need to average. What you need is a very chaotic Hamiltonian to have this approximate phenomenon. And what they uh, did is like this, uh, you know, the SYK model, which has a random coupling. They didn't sample over random couplings, but they took a particular realization that was uh, technically the simplest. It had only five operators in it with some random numbers, and they did some machine learning on it to make sure it's actually a chaotic Hamiltonian, and then they made that in the lab and did the experiment that way. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, how crucial is that you have ADS and ADS space? Is it necessary to have thermalization from the setting of the boundary? Or yeah, th that's one. That's exactly why uh, one of the very nice features is that because it's a box, a black hole does not evaporate because the radiation, as you say, gets bounced off the boundary. So you reach thermal equilibrium with the black hole and the radiation, and therefore it's a stable thermodynamic system. A black hole in flat space has a negative heat capacity and it just will evaporate away. Mm -hmm. uh, so this regulator also uh, helps for that. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the last point on the last slide uh, is precisely, uh, you know, that is an interesting challenge to extend all these things to other types of space times. In principle, by going deep into the box, we just have flat space. So we think flat space physics is in this somehow. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it's highly not difficult to uh, translate uh, all these lessons into uh, direct lessons for flat space, let alone for uh, the situ uh, or, or cosmological solution of space. Yes, I did. I allow myself a quite quick follow-up question and then uh, talk to you. So, uh, this, this beautiful uh, implication of synthesis for gravity, statistical physics, uh, to what extent does it rely on the box? Uh, of course, the test so far have been done. Yeah, but it, that's right. It's it's again technical. I, I would say it's a, I would say it's much more general uh, because the philosophy is simply we have incomplete information and we try to just make a, a model that we try to make the best possible model based on incomplete information and then inevitably you run into statistical physics thinking. So I think it's a much more general principle that you can apply to low energy effective gravitation theory. Okay, on that uh, note, uh, let's thank Jan again.